Welcome back to the City Current Radio Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're honored to be joined by our next guest. He's an author, and we get to dive in pretty deep to his new book. It's called Church Scattered, Christianity for the 21st Century. We're here with our friend Dan Greer. Dan, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jeremy. How about you? Doing well. So let's start with some context before we talk about the book. Give us a little bit of your background, and then we'll dive into Church Scattered. Uh, grew up in the 60s, uh, which I thought was uh, kind of the craziest time in the history of our country, but I, I believe we're trying to top it now, actually. So uh, I've been through this bad nightmare before, but hopefully it'll get better soon. But uh, I've spent an uh, uh, equal amount of time in corporate leadership as I have in church leadership, which uh, really is uh, at the heart of uh, Church Scattered. Uh, because as a Christian, I really uh, tried to live out my faith every day at work and certainly at home. Uh, and then as I transitioned uh, from the corporate world to church leadership, uh, I got to experience that culture and some of the challenges involved. Uh, in Memphis, uh, I went to Mid-America at the old uh, Jewish synagogue in Midtown and uh, was uh, serving with uh, Bellevue for 13 years. Uh, I was at Midtown for probably three years, and then when we moved to the new location. So I've uh, been married for 49 years. I uh, have two children and three grandchildren. Better get that part in. Nice. Absolutely. Talk about what led you to write the book, because I think it's a, it's a really interesting premise in the sense of comparing church gathered, being there in person versus church scattered. And obviously we'll talk a lot more in depth, but what led you to write this book? Well, it's really uh, both of the tensions that I mentioned, quite honestly, coming out of my background. When uh, I was a, uh, a corporate leader, uh, living out my faith every day, uh, I really felt like I was in the ministry and uh, uh, I was representing Christ uh, in everything that I did, every conversation, every interaction, whether it was a client or a customer or a coworker or whatever. And so uh, I really found myself uh, kind of getting caught in the 80s. If, if you went all in back then, uh, everyone would push you towards seminary. You were obviously called to be a pastor or a missionary because I think at the end of the day, you were making them very uncomfortable with, uh, you know, all your Christianity. So uh, I followed that path because really there was no other path and uh, kind of got caught up in the mega church movement. They were looking for corporate guys like me to help run these very large churches. But there was still the, the essence of my calling was how can I equip more Christians to live out their faith every day? Because for me, that's biblical Christianity. Then when I got into uh, church leadership, uh, things were really uh, exciting at the beginning with the mega church movement and uh, uh, growth uh, was incredible, particularly at Bellevue here in Memphis. And, uh, you know, the, the reality for church leaders, uh, attendance uh, is our ultimate metric. And so if things are growing, we feel like we're, you know, successful. And uh, I often compare it now to uh, my corporate guys, uh, their addiction to top line revenue. You know, if those numbers are going up, then things must be really well. Actually, what about that bottom line, uh, you know, profit uh, number? And so I began to really see the issues on both sides and uh, the, the tension in the church leadership world, honestly, uh, we use the term disruption a lot, but uh, we've been in it for about 50 years. Uh, Barna has been very good at tracking it. Uh, in North America, literally today, a third of the churches need a funeral, sadly. Uh, they're just not gonna make it. Uh, another third, uh, have plateaued and have been declining for probably 10 years. And so, you know, things are just not going well. If we were a for-profit, uh, you know, organization, we, we'd be out of business, we'd be filed for bankruptcy. So I really began to, to pray through uh, when the Gen Xers did not come back from college in the late 80s, you know, what, what do we really need to do? What's going on here? And I really uh, came to the conviction that there were some internal and external problems with the church as it existed. And I really began to try to innovate and create new strategies to help resolve those church leadership issues. And so as a practitioner, I got this, uh, you know, down the line uh, in Atlanta, I got to be very aggressive with it. 
Uh, we had a go that 30% of the people that were attending were unbelievers. So that created a lot of different strategies. And uh, all of that led me to the point of uh, feeling like I was in a very unique position as a practitioner to speak to both cultures, to speak to the corporate culture about making a profit. Uh, but for your entire organization, the point is, all right, then let's make a difference. Uh, and then into the church leadership culture, uh, we're in disruption, we're in decline. Uh, disruption demands transformation, not realignment. You just can't roll out the next slickest sermon series and think it'll work. And so I really began to pray through it, work on it. And uh, it took a year to write the book uh, out of those 50 years of life experience. But I'm, I'm really trying to integrate uh, faith and work leadership and life, secular and sacred, uh, tear down walls between clergy and laity. Uh, because if you really think about it, 95% uh, of our waking hours as Christians is spent in the church scattered. Uh, and when I see myself as a church gathered leader and I'm allocating 80% of my financial and manpower resources toward a 5% window of opportunity, uh, it doesn't take Michael Porter to tell you that's not strategically very aligned. So those were the burdens that I had that I wanted to try to speak into moving forward. And I like the fact that you point out, you know, you, you go to church on Sunday, you feel inspired, but like you said, that's a relatively small blip in the span of a full week and months and years. And so when you look at where the time is spent and then touching you touch on career, family, three generations. You really cover a lot of bandwidth with the book and diving in. And I think to your point, just understanding, okay, we're looking at this area, but the big picture of what we're trying to accomplish, that's the real goal is using the full 100% to really engage and be Christ-like and to go out and, um, and to reach more people as well. So talk about it from that vantage point of kind of the, the main goals, if you will. Yeah, the, the big thing uh, for me, uh, coming again from this background, you can imagine, uh, there's a lot of great work that's being done and has been done in, in just helping church leaders do church. Obviously, you know all the great work that's out there, even with Christian corporate leaders, C12, Convene, Businesses, Missions. What we're really trying to do in starting our network is to do the very same thing that you're doing. I, I look at your website, I'm super impressed by the network, the diversity of people that you get in the same room to talk about how can we do good in our city. And so I wanna get, uh, for the first time, at least from my experience, to get both church leaders and corporate leaders in the same room to have a conversation about how can we have the greatest gospel impact in our city and in the world. And so the idea would be again, to, to empower uh, Christians during the week. Uh, church leaders view their role as the setup for the week to come, not the payoff. Uh, and then we as Christians step up and assume responsibility that our faith has got to be as real on Monday as on Sunday. Uh, and then if everyone will kind of get in their lane and commit to work together around this shared outcome of what really is Christianity in the 21st century, I think we can have the greatest impact by doing that. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely a, a kind of a shift in terms of the way you look at the opportunity, which I think is really important. Let's start with, let's kind of take it in some pieces, but let's start with the career piece what's maybe one or two bits of advice when you talk about the integration? And I like the fact that you kind of go back to the eighties where you said, well, you know, if you talked about Christianity and faith in the business, then all of a sudden they push you to the ministry. And I feel like now more than ever, we're starting to realize that so much of the nonprofit business, the business is rooted in faith. And so now you're seeing so many um, really, you know, confident, courageous, but just amazing individuals lead with their faith as business leaders. And I think that's an important role model that is, is really helping others step out in their faith and take a more leadership role in terms of how they present in a business context their faith. But share maybe one or two lessons learned or bits of advice when it comes to leading with faith in the business. Yeah, and I, and I think that's really where it starts. And the reason it starts there is 85% of these three generations, as you mentioned, are not coming to church. 
but they are going to work. Uh, and I watched uh, uh, your interview with Michael Drake and some of the things y'all were talking about is obviously spot on to what we're talking about. And so, uh, you know, the whole corporate conscious movement started, uh, you know, a few years ago about uh, corporations realizing they needed to make a difference in their city. And so, you know, that was helpful. Uh, and, but what has happened for me, and I've been in this a long time now, uh, actually today, uh, I have never seen corporate best practice be more aligned with biblical truth. Uh, the last five years of training and speaking that I have done have been around character issues, honesty, integrity, speed of trust by Covey, uh, servant leadership, all of those things. And so for me now, it, it's, it's a dream come true that at the exact moment in time where three generations are pushing back against the church gathered, uh, for celebrity leadership or spending too much money on buildings or themselves or whatever, uh, to your point in Michael's conversation, they are looking for these character values uh, at work uh, and in their leaders. And so uh, if uh, Christians that own companies and lead organizations will realize that this is the perfect time in my lifetime to leverage biblical best practice for leadership best practice, if you will, because millennials, if you're gonna hire the best ones and retain them, uh, they're gonna see those character qualities in their leaders. They're, they wanna see a shared collaborative culture. They wanna see, uh, they're fine with making a profit as long as you do something with it, other than you know uh, pass the money up the stream, so to speak. So. I think all of that has just made this uh, uh, the most incredible opportunity that Christians have ever had. And I, I think in the workplace for me, you know, early on, we, we had some awkward missteps, uh, you know, uh, volunteer Bible studies or, you know, lunch and learns that tried to go a little too far toward Bible study. And uh, today, to, uh, just give you one example to answer your question, there's a great company in Birmingham and uh, a, a mid-sized company, uh, but what they do every year is they have a team of both leadership, management, and frontline workers, and they choose a Compassion International project. And what the company agrees to do for every dollar given by the employees, they will match it. And then they will take a particular project and send a team uh, across all spectrums of their leadership culture. And they will go to that particular area of the world for two weeks. They'll send a videographer, shoot it all up. And then at their annual event, even though they do talk about profits, they do talk about productivity, the, the big moment of the night is to tell the stories about the two weeks and the difference that they made together. And so that's just a great illustration of integrating work and faith without feeling like, you know, quote, it needs to be a Bible study, so to speak. I think people are craving purpose. And to your point, there is a deep rooted desire in the workplace to feel like you're making a difference and that there's a higher purpose and you're not just making a widget or selling a service. You, you want to feel like you're making a difference. And I feel like as individuals, as humans, when you can tap into that purpose, it's a powerful opportunity and especially to role model what, what Christ is like. And that then draws people in to want to know more. And I feel like it's a powerful opportunity for all of us. I agree in the workplace to do good, but also to role model it and to open those conversations and open those doors, carry that into the family in terms of being more intentional with your family. What's one or two tips. Well, I think uh, for me, uh, it starts with the, uh, the realization again that all the sacred and secular priorities in life need to be merged together in, in, in the faith idea. And so, uh, for example, one of the things I've been doing since the 80s when Covey wrote Seven Habits is I've had a, I've had a personal mission statement, a life plan. And so what that does is it says, uh, you know, personal leadership is a responsibility that you have, regardless of whether you have positional leadership in, in your work environment or not. So you need to lead yourself really, really well. You're your most important client. And so the book, and it leads in heavily to life planning and setting those priorities and specific goals that you can measure about leading yourself. And at that particular point in time, part of Christian leadership, which is who we are, uh, at that point in time, your responsibility for your marriage comes second priority. 
uh, with your faith being first, uh, your responsibility to your children becomes uh, your third priority. Uh, and then work and friends and other things, community are down the line. And uh, what happens then is uh, life is not segmented. You don't feel like you're winning in one area and failing in the other. And uh, I say this statement just to make the point, uh, probably the most sacred place in all of life is the kitchen table. And when Christians see that and, and recognize this is holy work, uh, and I need to feel just as spiritual here leading my family as I would on Sunday morning listening to a message or music. And so it's that uh, integrated part of your life and, and all of it revolves around, again, your personal relationship with Christ. Yeah, I, I, I agree and I love that. Carry it forward into how we can get the book, you know, where do we go? How do we, you know, find you online? So talk about where we get the book and obviously where we can go online with websites, social media, where do we go? Yeah, churchscattered.com is our website and uh, we've had it up now for a few months and uh, obviously the book is on the website and uh, you can click uh, on Amazon and get it there. Uh, we also have a podcast that we're uh, into our fifth uh, uh, episode and really enjoying that, kind of helping people to understand what Church Gathered is all about. It's certainly not anti-church gathered. It's all the church. It's just really prioritizing living out our faith every day. And so the podcast talks about that. Uh, we have a Facebook page that uh, has a lot of content on it. Uh, and we are committed to just continue to leveraging a lot of different social media platforms to communicate uh, about uh, really what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, the, the hard part, and this is where, you know, you can help me uh, just as a, a final thought is, uh, you know, today in this cancer culture, you know, it seems like it's all or nothing on the right or the left. And so we, we deal with that tension. And as I look at your organization, uh, I write a statement in the book that probably is going to get a little bit of pushback, but I say that social justice without eternal redemption is really not justice at all. And all I simply mean by that is that we as the church, you know, have to lean into redemption as a priority more than restoration. However, I would make the, the, the other statement, which is, you know, eternal redemption without social justice is not redemption at all. So, you know, having to find the, the messy middle and be willing to do what you do, which is uh, increase the good uh, for the community, but we also believe the gospel is good news. So living in that tension of how to, to be redemptive uh, and at the same time restorative uh, and, and not having to throw either one of those out as an either or dynamic, but a both and, uh, that to me is kind of our greatest challenge moving forward. Give me one quote that inspires you or helps guide you. And obviously it can be from the Bible or from the book, but give me a quote that kind of helps guide you with this work. Uh, no doubt. Uh, it's by Thomas Watson, the CEO of IBM. Nothing so conclusively proves a person's ability to lead others is what you do from day to day to lead yourself. So for me, Christian leadership is the perfect, uh, you know, title, uh, definition of who I am. And I know that my primary responsibility is to own my own spiritual growth and development. The more effectively I do that, the greater impact I'll be able to have. Well, one more time, tell them where to go. So website, where do we get the book? How do we follow you and your efforts? Churchscattered.com is the website. The book is there, Church Scattered, uh, Christianity of 21st Century. Amazon's the quickest way to get it. And again, the podcast, and uh, we're doing webinars, masterminds, uh, going to start a book club uh, very soon. So uh, we're going to follow in your footsteps. You're, uh, uh, you, you're incredibly creative in all of your uh, platforms and how you use them, but I love the alignment of your messaging. So uh, we're just going to draft in behind you a little bit and try to, you know, learn from you and... Uh, the biggest thing for us, our, our culture, and I love it, uh, it, it's your culture. We, we are lifelong learners, but we're lifelong givers. And so we, we want to continue to grow. We want to continue to give. And so if we can model that as your organization models it so well in this city, we, we feel like we can make a difference. Well, I absolutely love where your heart is. I love what you're doing. And I think it is important when you look at everything that you stand for and that 
power the good. One, we're in this together, but two is just like with Church Scattered, you've got to reach them in many different places. Everyone now has uh, a lot going on, and so the more you can reach them where they are, the more successful you'll be. So definitely appreciate you coming on the show. Appreciate all you're doing. Thank you very much, Dan. Well, we appreciate you uh, having me and having us and uh, look forward to working together down the road. And uh, I'm going to take advantage uh, of some of the opportunities you offer here in the city. So maybe we'll get to bump into each other down the road.